Hey everybody, it's your Mr. Bird here. We are going to talk about the French and Indian War. Okay, so the first thing I want to go over is a little bit of background. Okay, so for centuries, going back into the Middle Ages, there was a long-standing rival between rivalry between France and England, and this war was part of it. Okay, um, the war was fought in Europe from 1754 to 1763, and it's also known as the Seven Years' War. It was one of the first examples of global conflict with multiple countries on each side. It is somewhat of the beginning of how wars get fought more and more and culminate with things like World War I and World War II in the, uh, <clears throat> in the 20th century. All right. Now let's talk about why was this war fought in North America? Okay. The English concern were concerned that French forts were being built uh, in the Ohio River Valley. Okay. And you kind of see them over here. We got Fort Boeuf, Fort uh, Prince-Quel-Ile, and then Fort Duscone um, here. Uh, these blue ones up here. And then down here we have British forts. Uh, Redstone, Old Fort, Fort Necessity, and Fort Cumberland. Um these are the, the British holdings, and of course, these are the French holdings. Um, so what happens is, is essentially France is starting to move into the Ohio River, Ohio River Valley, which they had long-term claims on, and British citizens from the colonies were pushing over the Appalachian Mountains into the same area. The British and the French had both claimed it and counterclaimed it, and so nobody really was clear on who had control over the Ohio River Valley. Okay, um, so George Washington was a fairly young man at the time, and uh, he was uh, sent into this war to actually discuss and negotiate with the French about making sure that there was, you know, safety for everybody and there would be plenty of uh, land for everyone. So what he said about that, because he was so young and he was an important to, appointed to such an important task, was it was an extraordinary circumstance that so young and experienced a person, he's talking about himself, be employed or be asked to um, go on a negotiation with which the subjects of their uh, gr uh, greatest importance were involved. And of course, this is, this is talking about the balance of power between France and England in the world at the time because they were the two most powerful, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, empires at the time. Okay. Now, let's talk about some of the initial conflicts. Uh, there's a picture of young George Washington. Uh, he was a major general at the time. I'm sorry, he was just a major at the time. Uh, young Major George Washington uh, leads a small force into the Ohio Valley in September uh, or in 1754. Um, he hoped to capture the French fort of Denisque. Okay. Um, and uh, but he got defeated and forced to retreat, and he built Fort Necessity, where the th where three rivers converge. Okay, and he was defeated by the French and the Native American forces, and had to return to Virginia because they raided Fort Necessity one night. All right, and here is a picture, a woodcut uh, that was displayed in several magazines. Washington with his War Council during the Battle of Fort Necessity. After deliberations, it was decided to withdraw and surrender the fort. And at this point, formal war gets declared, and the British send over one of their top generals, Braddock, um, to drive the French out of the Ohio Valley in 1755. He was defeated and killed soon after by, French and in, by a French and Indian ambush. War is officially declared in 1756. Now, what do the two sides have going for them? Okay, so England had one ally, the Iroquois Indians, but they had a colonial population of over a million, okay? And colonial activities, they had towns, they had trade, they had farms, they had just essentially a very well-established set of colonies with their own economy and their own governments. What did France have? Um, they had larger Indian allies because they were a lot more friendly to the Indians, the Algonquin, the Huron, and the Ottawa. Uh, the colonial population of France, or New France at the time, was 70,000. And the colonial activities they did was they did fur trading and missionary work with priests. Um, so the French were somewhat like the Spanish in the sense that they wanted to go out and convert everyone to Christianity. They were unlike the Spanish that they really did kind of believe that Native Americans were equal people to them. And so they didn't treat them poorly. They learned from them. They innovated with them. They figured out a whole lot of new ways to, um, to work. 
together and building the colony of New France. Okay. Now, there are a few early battles. The French capture the British forts at Lake Ontario and Lake George, okay? France and France's Native American allies raid farms from New York, uh, from the New York, uh, Virginia frontier side, so all up and down the Appalachian Mountains, okay? Um, and then the British settlers uh, with farms and houses um, on that, uh, in that area, got their houses burned down and many of them had to flee down to the coast again and out of the mountains. Okay. And here's a picture of British forces under fire from the French and American Indian forces at Monongahela, uh, which is one of the rivers that runs into Pittsburgh. The battle saw the British attempt to take Fort Donisque and they were repulsed or forced back. Okay. Another thing about the battles, France and its allies dominated the war for three years, the first three years of the war, winning victories at Fort Oswego and Fort William Henry. But Ticonderoga, <clears throat> the battle at Ticonderoga begins a turn. All right. And here's another uh, period uh, picture. August of 1756, French soldiers and native warriors led by Louis-Joseph de Montcalm, uh, successfully attacked Fort Oswego. Okay. The next thing we got going on is Pitt. Okay. He was a British foreign minister. <clears throat> he was a Quaker and he is what Pittsburgh is named after the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and he helped turn the tide in 1758. He made peace with important Indian allies and started telling people to adopt the Indian way of fighting, which we call today guerrilla fighting. Um, they were able to hit and run, um, it causing a lot of damage with minimal force loss. Okay. Now there was a British victory in this war. Okay. In September, 1759, British general James Wolfe, who had replaced Braddock, um, led a surprise attack on Quebec. Um, and, <clears throat> and there was a British victory at Fort Niagara, uh, cutting off the French frontier fort. So in other words, they took Fort Niagara, and Fort Niagara was the point at which the supplies came out of upper New France and went into the Ohio Valley. So none of the forts got resupplied, and so it starved out the French um, fighters. Okay, And that led England to eventually win the war. Okay. Um, history, this historian Francis Parkman described the death of Wolfe. So Britain lost two major generals in this world, in this war. There was Wolfe and there was Braddock. Okay. But here's the picture of dying Wolfe. They asked him if he would have a surgeon, but he shook his head and answered that all was over for him. His eyes closed with the torpor of approaching death. In other words, slowing down. Okay. And those around sustained his fainting form that they could withhold their gaze from the wild turmoil before them and the charging ranks of their companions rushing through the line of fire and smoke see how they run one of the officers exclaimed as the french fled in confusion before the before the leveled bayonets who run demanded wolf opening his eyes like a man aroused from sleep the enemy sir was the reply they Gave, they give way everywhere. Then, said the dying general, tell Colonel River to cut off their retreat from the bridge. Now, God be praised. I die contented. And he kind of like murmured something. And he turned on his side and he breathed his last and he died. And he died knowing that his troops had actually won the day. Okay. Our next thing we're going to talk about is the end of a war, and all wars end with a treaty. Okay, and so the Treaty of Paris. Um, so France lost its Canadian colonies, uh, which are up here. Okay, um, and any, but they got to colonies and claims of any land east of the Mississippi River, so the Ohio Valley all the way down to the Gulf Coast. Okay, and then. Um, the other thing they had was that England got all the French territory in Canada, Florida from the Spanish, uh, for other reasons, and rights to the Caribbean slave trade. In other words, they suddenly got a monopoly on every slave that was going from Africa and into America. And it's going to make them a ton of money. Um, 
Spain got France's territory west of the Mississippi River and New Orleans, okay? And so that's over here, which becomes Spanish Louisiana. And it has an interesting effect on Texas history, too, because this is the point at which France has to start backing off and leaving Texas. And the Spanish would control it um, until they began the impresario system in the 1830s and uh, Anglos would start moving in, all right? Okay. And here's kind of a map comparison. On the left, you've got the what, what it used to look like with the Mississippi River and all of this French territory sort of wedged between the two pieces of Britain and backing up to the Spanish territory. This was the conflicted territory that we've been talking about in this war, okay? Um, the Ohio River Valley the Ohio River running into the Mississippi River, um, and then there's the uh, Missouri. So essentially, France had claimed all the land that had tributaries of water going into the Gulf of Mexico at New Orleans. And in other words, everything that essentially emptied into the Mississippi and then moved on down into the Gulf. All right. But if we look over here to the right, we're going to see the other way, what, what happens, okay? Okay. Um, we end up with Spanish Louisiana over here on the west side of the Mississippi River. And on the east side of the Mississippi River, we get the um, British. And one of the things that they do is they establish this line here called the line of the Proclamation of 1763. And they control, essentially, um, the movement of settlers going west. This, of course, aggravates the colonists because, like, where are you going to tell us where we can go live? We came here for you to stop bothering us, okay? And so this war had some effects besides what we've been talking about. Chief Pontiac um, forms a Native American ally and strikes back at the British. He was part of the... Um, the natives who did not ally with the British. Uh, Pontiac's war ends in 1765, okay? England issues, of course, the Proclamation of 1763 to prevent further westward expansion uh, um, and issues new taxes on the colonies to pay for the war, okay? And they were like, hey, we took care of you, okay? And so it's really, an, it's really upon you to help pay for all the money we spent, okay? And then friction, because of this taxing and the loss of the ability to move west, the colonies start getting very aggravated and upset with the British. So we can talk about Pontiac for a second. Um, his picture's on the left there. Pontiac struck an alliance of Ottawa, Huron, Miami, Delaware, Shawnee, Mingo, and Iroquois Indians. He actually got some of the Iroquois to join them, okay? Uh, they were unable to drive away the British, but the uprising prompted the British to modify their policies that had provoked conflict. Beginning with the conference hosted by the Shawnee in 1767, the following um, decades, leaders such as Joseph Brandt, Alexander McGilvery, Blue Jacket, and Tecumseh would attempt to forge confederacies that would revive the resistance efforts of Pontiac's war. So essentially they were still trying to push away the British and have control of their land because essentially they were uh, the British, the French, the Spanish were all colonizing that land. Okay. And that's about everything I got to go over with you guys. So um, I let it go there and we will talk um, a little bit later. I uh, hope I'll be talking to you guys uh, all week long about this. This is the beginning of the Revolutionary War and the beginning of America breaking away from England.